Now we have been calculating derivatives of functions starting from the definitions and we have seen that we have to repeat the same calculations over and over again. So in this section we are going to try to do these calculations once and for all to establish some rules to differentiate functions in order to not have to repeat these same calculations anymore. Let's start with a power rule. In other words, let's start by trying to establish a formula to differentiate a power of the variable. The simplest possible case would be just a constant. If we want to differentiate a constant, it is easy to see what is the derivative of a constant function because a constant function has a graph that is an horizontal line and the derivative of a function geometrically at a certain value of x is the slope of the tangent line to the graph. If the graph is itself a line, the tangent line to a line is the same line. Since this line is horizontal, it has slope 0 and therefore the derivative is 0. Similarly, the derivative of the function f of x equal x is easy to obtain with a similar argument because the graph of the function is the line y equal x. This is the line of slope 1 and again the tangent line to a line is a line itself so at any value of x the tangent line to the graph of f of x equal x as slope 1. Therefore the derivative is a constant function 1. If we turn to the next power of x, x squared, um, well then this is a, a little bit harder to interpret geometrically but we can go with the type of calculations we have been doing starting from the definition. Derivative of x squared by definition is the limit as h is approaching 0 of x plus h squared minus x squared all this over h. If we expand the square we obtain x squared plus 2xh plus h squared and after cancelling x squared we obtain the limit as h approaches 0 of 2xh plus h squared in which we can factor out an h and after cancelling out this common factor h we obtain the limit of 2x plus h as h approaches 0. This is a polynomial in h so to obtain this limit we only need to plug h equals 0 and we obtain 2x. So the derivative of x squared is the function 2x. Let's do one more before we try to guess a general pattern. We want the derivative of x cubed and so we can go by the definition. It is the limit as h is approaching 0 of x plus h cubed minus x cubed over h. Expanding the cube we obtain x cubed plus 3x square h plus 3x h square plus h cube. x cube cancels out and in the remaining terms you see that there is an h in each one of the three terms in the sum at the top. Therefore we can factor out h and this way we obtain the common factor h at the top and at the bottom. After cancellation we obtain the limit as h is approaching 0 of 3x square plus 3xh plus h square. As a function of h this is polynomial and to obtain this limit we only need to plug h equals 0. That makes the second and third term in this sum equal to 0 and therefore we obtain 3x square. In other words the derivative of x cubed is 3x square. So we have the derivative of x is 1, of x square is 2x, of x cubed is 3x square and it begins to look like to obtain the derivative of a power of x we can pull down the exponent and then decrease the power by 1. Right? We get power 1 when we start with x squared, power 2 when we start with x cubed and we can already guess that maybe if we were to do a similar calculation for x to the fourth we would get something like 4x cubed. This general rule that the derivative of x to the n is n multiplied by x to the n minus 1 
is known as a parallel. We verified it for n equal 1, 2, and 3, and we can more generally, if n is a positive integer, try to establish this by considering the function f of x equal x to the n, and looking at the derivative of this function at a. By definition, it is a limit when x is approaching a of f of x minus f of a divided by x minus a. In other words, limit at a of x to the n minus a to the n divided by x minus a. At the top, we have a polynomial in x that takes a value 0 when x is equal to a. So we know for a fact that x minus a is a factor at the top. The question, of course, is how to factor x minus a out of x to the n minus a to the n. But this is a standard factorization, and one that you may want to verify by multiplying things through and see that all the terms cancel out except for x to the n and a to the n, or by long division of x to the n minus a to the n. In any case, this is the factorization we obtain, and so if we substitute in the limit x to the n minus a to the n by this expression, we have the common factor x minus a at the top and at the bottom, and after cancelling them, we obtain that f prime of a is the limit of this expression. This is a polynomial in x, so to obtain this limit we just plug x equal a, you see that in the first term we're going to get a to the n minus 1. In the second term, a to the n minus 2 multiplied by a, so that's again a to the n minus 1. In the third term, a to the n minus 3 multiplied by a squared, so we get n a to the n minus 1 again. And so we get a to the n minus 1 each time. If you count the terms, let's say for instance by counting the powers of x, see that the powers of x go from n minus 1 to 0. In other words, there are n terms. So we obtain n multiplied by a to the n minus 1. This is f prime of a. In other words, this establishes the parallel for a positive integer n. So, for instance, if we want now to obtain the derivative of x to the 97, we no longer need to go back to the definition and expand a power 97, we simply use this parallel to the effect that the derivative is 97x to the 97 minus 1, that is 96. Now we have established this for n a positive integer. What if n was negative? Let's say for instance we consider the case of n equal negative 1 x to the negative 1 can be rewritten as 1 over x. So, the derivative of 1 over x, this is um, something that we have done before. This is the limit as h is approaching 0 of 1 over x plus h minus 1 over x, all this divided by h. We have seen examples like that before. When we have a fraction at the top, a combination of two fractions at the top, we can combine them by um, obtaining the same denominator, which would be x multiplied by x plus h. And if we do that, we obtain x minus x plus h divided by x x plus h, and all this divided by h again. At the top, we get x minus x minus h, so we only have minus h, and this is divided by h multiplied by x and x plus h. After cancelling the common factor h, we obtain the limit of negative 1 over x x plus h as h approaches 0, and when we plug h equals 0, we get negative 1 over x squared. This can be rewritten as negative 1 multiplied by x to the negative 2. Now observe that this matches the parallel because we started with n equal negative 1, and we obtain this factor negative 1 in front. On the other end, in the parallel, we have n times x to the n minus 1. And this power n minus 1, when n is negative 1, is 
minus 1 minus 1, negative 2. So, the same power rule applies in the case x equal negative 1, and even though we are not going to verify it generally, it applies for any negative integer. What if the power was rational instead, a fraction? Let's take a look at a case that we know how to handle from the definition. For instance, n equal 1 half. In that case, if I look at the derivative of x to the 1 half, this is simply the derivative of square root of x, and by definition, this is a limit of root of x plus h minus root x over h as h approaches 0. We know how to obtain this kind of limits. We have an indeterminate form of the type 0 over 0, and we cannot factor because we have radicals. But we've seen before how to deal with this. We multiply top and bottom by the conjugate. So at the top, I have a product of the form a minus b a plus b, so I obtain the difference of the squares, specifically x plus h minus x. At the bottom, I have h multiplied by the conjugate of the original quantity at the top. x cancels out at the top, and we end up with h over h multiplied by the conjugate. After cancelling the common factor h, we obtain the limit at 0 of 1 over root of x plus h plus root of x. Plugging h equals 0, we obtain 1 over 2 root x. Observe that again this matches the power rule, because we can rewrite this expression as 1 half multiplied by x to the negative 1 half, simply because 1 over root x is 1 over x to the 1 half, in other words, x to the negative 1 half. This matches the formula because we started with the derivative of x to the 1 half, so n is 1 half, and indeed we have this factor 1 half in front. On the other hand, this power n minus 1, if n is 1 half, we get 1 half minus 1, negative 1 half. So the power rule works for negative integers, for rational numbers, and in fact more generally for any real number n. So for instance, if we want to differentiate the cubic root of x to the fourth, we can write that as x to the fourth third, because the cubic root is taking the power one third, and apply the power rule where n is four third. So we obtain 4 third x to the 4 third minus 1, which is 1 third, and x to the 1 third is simply cubic root of x. Even if the power is some irrational number like pi, and we want to differentiate x to the pi, we would obtain simply pi x to the pi minus 1, applying the power rule. Now what if we wanted to differentiate a polynomial? We certainly ought to be able to do that uh, in an efficient manner. But so far, what we know how to differentiate in this is uh, are all the powers of x and the constants. You see that a polynomial is built as a sum of constant multiples of powers of x. We know how to differentiate powers of x, so the next step for us to be able to differentiate arbitrary polynomials is to know how to differentiate sums of functions, if we know the derivative of each term, and constant multiples of functions. So this is what we're going to do now. Let's start 